I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Greg DiNicola, the Vice President of the Galuna Beach Historical Society. <clears throat> and this marks our sixth program of the year. Uh, the record should indicate, for those interested, today is October 22nd, 2013. We're here to acknowledge, uh, we don't want to use the word celebrate, but pay homage to the 20 year anniversary of the Laguna firestorm that affected us in um, 1993. It affected just about anybody and everybody who lived or worked in Laguna Beach at the time. Um, it's a little like the JFK thing. I think anybody who was in town that time can remember the, where they were when they heard the, the news and the sirens, and uh, I suspect almost everybody in this room was, was here at that time. It uh, started off the Canyon Road, a uh, suspected arsonist, 26 square miles, scorched, 27,000 residents evacuated, uh, over a half million dollars in damage, 1993 dollars. To go over this in tonight's program, it's my honor to introduce a fellow board member. His fund of knowledge of Laguna Beach, is history is legendary. He is our newsletter guru, and I consider him the heart and soul of our society. Please join me in a warm welcome for Gene Felder to moderate the program. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, what uh, we'll be doing tonight uh, is, uh, which uh, is being recorded, so this is like oral history, and um, uh, it is to be televised on Cox Channel 30. I don't know if it really is, but I'm TiVoing it. Uh, uh, we'll have, uh, we're going to show the video clip that's on the city's website. Uh, that will certainly, if you haven't seen it before, it puts you in the mood for it. Then we have a PowerPoint, and then we have joining us a, a non-board member of the Laguna Beach Historical <coughs> Society, Nancy Lindsay. She went out the day after the fire, and she has a video clip that uh, we, will, uh, we will show uh, with uh, Nancy and her sister uh, narrating it uh, during the video clip. What this has uh, uh, is photos from the um, uh, wildfire and uh, text and information from the, from the Orange County Fire Authority Chief Holmes report. Uh, so um, let's go uh, th through it and uh, see, see if, uh, what it says. So here's the report from Orange County Fire Chief Larry Holmes. Uh, this was not a Laguna Beach fire. It was an Orange County Fire Authority fire 
set out in the canyon, and so he was the one who, who did the report, not Chief du, uh, Dewberry. In the report, he says it started by an arsonist, it destroyed or severe, severely damaged 441 homes, it burned uh, 14,337 no, uh, acres, $528 million in damage. And I don't believe they've ever found the arsonist, correct? Well, the guy con uh, uh, confessed, Oh, but he turned out to be a liar. Oh. <laughs> well, you hate when that happens. Of course, the positive uh, news is we did make the cover of Newsweek. We have a copy uh, uh, up here in our uh, mementos. Uh, I think one of the newspapers up here says 65,000 acres were, uh, were burnt. So there were many other fires going on at the same time of the Laguna wildfire. Casper's Park also burned the same night up, uh, up the Ortega Highway. I live in top of the world. This is uh, looking uh, uh, down to, uh, to the ocean. The ocean's way up here. Here's the top of the world, which is about a thousand foot elevation, and here's all this smoke and fire going on. Mystic Hills, Mystic Hills neighborhood, of course, took the bulk of the um, of the damage. Um, we'll certainly see from Nancy's uh, video clip. Not every house got destroyed. This this was a selective cropping, I think, to show that they all were destroyed which was apparently true in this one section. Here's the Laguna Coastline News, the front page. Fire of hell. Stark uh, devastation following, uh, oh, it's got uh, over 350 homes lost. We were a little bit upset that although Laguna has 10,000 houses, uh, or at the time, uh, when 441 were destroyed, the headlines was, Laguna is left in ashes. There's the 65,000 acres in the Southland. Um, but obviously our businesses uh, were up and running and we wanted people to come to Laguna Beach and support those businesses. Here's the front page from the Orange County Register. It's a holocaust. And the fire started out in the uh, uh, Laguna Canyon on the north side of Laguna Canyon Road, and it went right for uh, El Moro and Emerald Bay. And uh, I think they had fire trucks lined up on, on Laguna Canyon Road thinking that that was a good fire break. But later in the day, uh, at some number of different spots, the fire leapt over um, Laguna Canyon Road. Uh, the fire department had a, had the staging area at Thurston Middle School. They had to abandon that staging area and redeploy at Main Beach. Uh, Thurston Middle School had one uh, school building uh, burnt, and uh, and then then the fire went to uh, uh, Temple Hills Drive. And up uh, where Park Avenue really turns, there's Hidden Valley. So Hidden Valley had a, a fire in there, too. The Orange County Register published a special um, magazine, Inferno, and many of the photos that I'm showing are from this uh, magazine. Uh, many uh, other photos are from Lucia uh, D'Angelo. So here's the uh, fire's toll, 2, 2 p.m. It made Emerald Bay and Boat Canyon, 3.30 Canyon Acres Drive, 4 o'clock Mystic Hills, 5 p.m. El Moro and Temple Hills. And in some point during the day, the students that were in um, the canyon were evacuated to the high school, and then they had to re-evacuate, and they ended up down in Dana Point. So here's the timeline. They got 911 calls just before noon, 1150. 
2 o'clock Emerald Bay, 2 o'clock Boat Canyon, 3.30 Canyon Acres, 4 p.m. Skyline and Mystic Hills, 5 p.m. El Moro and Temple Hills. Of course, it was Santa Ana wind conditions uh, coming from the east. At midnight uh, around there, the normal westerly winds blew the fire back upon itself, and the fire was de declared contained. Not all Laguna Beach people get uh, hyper and panic. So here are a couple of people at uh, Main Beach uh, looking at the fire. This is uh, El Moro Motor, El Moro Bay uh, in the uh, mobile homes. And what is this, Abalone uh, Point? Yes. What is this, uh, Irvine Upper Cove? Upper Irvine Cove. Upper Irvine Cove, and here's the fires uh, coming up. At the uh, El Moro uh, mobile home area, they had propane tanks explode. 44 mobile homes were destroyed. The weather, it was typical Santa Ana conditions, according to Chief Holmes. Winds at 40 miles per hour, gusts at 92 miles per hour. It wasn't that hot. It was 78 degrees, but it was dry. Relative humidity, 6 to 7%. And the fuel moisture, the fuel content of the plants out there, the chaparral, 4%. Here's a structure fully engaged. Here's Coast Highway looking north from St. Anne's. Here's police officer. Chief Holmes report, law enforcement used both north and southbound lanes of Coast Highway to channel bumper-to-bumper -bumper evacuation traffic out of the city. Residents evacuated southward while firefighters and their vehicles funneled, funneled in from the north. Here's the evacuation going south down Coast Highway. Bumper-to-bumper bumper evacuation. I think after the uh, fire, we somehow got the idea the entire town had evacuated. But what the police uh, later told us is that they just had neighborhood by neighborhood, section by section. Otherwise, it would have even been more, been more congested. And people a long way from the uh, fire, there was no reason to uh, evacuate. Um, here's the Ritz Carlton evacuee rates in a drawing by two uh, students. Uh, rates, uh, $200 per night. Uh, no pets allowed, they're crossed out. Only, only $90 per night. Pets allowed, a uh, special offer for Laguna Beach evacuees only. That is exactly my story. I got a call working in Van Nuys, and uh, I called my wife. We had, uh, if you remember, car phones <laughs> that were on a, on a cord. And uh, so I went to Lucky Shopping Center, which I think now is Albertsons, and to meet my wife, who uh, I told to get out of uh, our house uh, in top of the world. She said she could see the flames. I had the presence of mind to say, take the family photos. And um, she drove down the hill some ways, and then she turned around to go get her hair moose. She figured it's one thing for my house to burn down, but it might as well look good. In the meantime, I'm at uh, Ralph's. I call the Ritz Carlton. Uh, uh, there's the uh, uh, Felder family slogan, brave men run in our family. So I was trying to get the hell out of there. So I called the Ritz Carlton. They said, sure enough, it was $200. I said, that'll be fine. And then when I gave them my address, they said, are you evacuating? And I said, uh, yes, I am. They charged me $99. And, uh, but I was scared even at the Ritz-Carlton because you could see the Ortega fire the other direction. Uh, so instead of an ocean view, we got a fire <coughs> view uh, room. And all we did was call family. And at that time, of course, the charges were pretty good on the hotel uh, using the telephone. So when we checked out the next day, 
uh, the bill was $200, $99 for the room and about $99 <laughs> of phone charges. <laughs> Here's a fella on the roof uh, watering down. Here's another photo from that infernal, the Orange County Register. A house in Laguna Beach is attacked by rentless wind-whipped flames as firefighters make a valiant effort to stave off something. Here's a house that's completely gone. House and car. I don't know how they got this photo looking down on it. The mutual aid was tremendous. So I don't know what at the time and currently Laguna Beach maybe has five fire engines. We have three fire uh, stations, right? No, we have four fire stations. So we might have six or seven fire engines. But uh, when there's an emergency like this, uh, uh, support comes from all over. Now they were lined up. 345 fire engines, 17 dozers, bulldozers, I guess, 11 hand crews, 30 aircraft, 1,968 fire personnel. Uh, if you recall, the, the Malibu fire was going on at the time that this fire started, and I think two people died in the Malibu fire. Uh, but even with people on the roof, uh, uh, with garden hoses and so forth, I'm not aware of anyone being injured, and not a single life was lost. Now, if you look closely at this uh, vehicle, it says Fort Bragg here. So this was only, a, our fire was only a one-day fire. He, he certainly didn't drive down in one day. Uh, so he may have already been in Malibu, and they may have sent him down uh, from there. So here it is, Fort Bragg Fire Department. Fire engines in uh, Laguna Canyon. The rate of the fire was phenomenal. Top half of Emerald Canyon burned at a rate of 100 acres per minute, flashed across Laguna Canyon Road in six places. It leapt up two-thirds uh, two slopes, 200-foot flame heights. The fire burned one and a quarter miles of brush in 17 minutes to Canyon Acres. It overran the command post at Thurston Middle School, jumped Park Avenue, Temple Hills, at Temple Hills Drive, 27 homes were lost. At 10 p.m., the wind shifted, and at midnight, the Orange County Fire Authority declared that the fire was contained. Just commenting on uh, Emerald Canyon, of the entire Greenbelt, particularly north of the uh, Canyon Road, Emerald Canyon was the only one that had a continuous running source of water. There was a, a small waterfall, really only about two feet tall, that flowed year-round, even in, in a drought year like this. And as the chief of the Orange County Harbors, Beaches, and Parks Department, about a week after the fire, we commandeered the Larry Sweet and uh, Barbara Norton and the, and the park rangers and did a reconnaissance drive through the, the burned out north arc of the Greenbelt and drove down into Emerald Canyon. And I very much regret to have to tell you that because it was a main water source, the floor of the canyon was filled with hundreds and hundreds of charred animals. Deer, mostly, obviously the largest animals. It was just a complete, you know. Here, uh, the fire, uh, fire engines are uh, lined up. Um, I live on Park Avenue. My wife and I there at the ritz Crown were quite certain our house was gone. And neighbors who stayed behind uh, waiting to be told to evacuate, told us that for the longest time there wasn't a single fire engine anywhere. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 there's a fire engine in front of every house. Uh, uh, behind me is the open space, and uh, uh, the neighbor who stayed behind said it was just engulfed with flames, and then an uh, uh, aerial f uh, plane came and dumped fire retardant on it, and poof, it went out. But I was at the Ritz-Carlton, so I don't know. <laughs> According to Chief Holmes' report, the air tankers delayed by priorities from other numerous fires burning in S Southern California at the time 
would not arrive until approximately 1.40 p.m., one hour and 32 minutes from the initial request by the incident commander. Now, we usually don't say bad words uh, at our programs, but I am, I'm going to now because I think it's historically correct. When they called up uh, Riverside asking for aerial firefighting support, the first two words uttered were, oh shit, because everything was deployed. So they didn't have anything to send. They had to call back uh, planes that were sent elsewhere. So, uh, but when they got here, they uh, dropped the fire retardant and uh, did a lot of good. It looks like he's uh, unhappy, but I probably is uh, trying to get attention or something to get that helicopter to drop uh, maybe on his house or something. Here's that photo once again with uh, the Pacific Ocean on the top, top of the world neighborhood up here. This, uh, this, I would think, is the tot lot at, in uh, Alta Laguna Park and the tennis courts. Here's uh, part of the firefighting arsenal. A, a tanker aircraft releases uh, the uh, fire retardant over El Moro Canyon near Laguna Beach. Here's a wall of flames. Now, uh, Chief Dewberry uh, gave a report about the fuel modification program in Laguna Beach and said that it had made a big difference. You know, the thing the fire department talks about is defensible space. And uh, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but the height of the flames and the temperature as they went through the chaparral, and then they hit the area that the goats had uh, chewed on, and the flames were much less temperature and le less high, and so the fire, fire department had uh, at least a better chance at fighting the fire. <coughs> when we had this program uh, 10 years ago, Clay's Anderson, who, who, the operator of the Hotel Laguna, who has since died, his home was lost up in Mystic Hills, and he told us that it was so hot that radiant heat would start the houses up there on fire so that the flames would still be 100, 150 feet from the homes, and the homes would burst into flames from the inside. Hey, I think we already saw this. Anyway, that's uh, aerial firefighting capability. Here's another one. Here's uh, some damage, a lot of devastation. Here's a photo, the silhouette in the uh, Orange County Register Inferno magazine. Another silhouette of a <coughs> firefighter. Uh, here, he's apparently cooling off the fire engine, unless somebody else can think of a better explanation. Taking a break. Burned down to the steel belts, to the rims. Uh, here's a photo of the firefighters setting backfires out there in the chaparral. I think this is Mystic Hills looking down over uh, Laguna Beach. Uh, apparently, the uh, firefighter is, uh, is resting, but he's also looking out for embers. And the fire, Laguna Wildfire was declared con contained at midnight. Some R&R on uh, Forest Avenue, I would uh, think, or uh, South Coast Highway. We were able to return the very next day. Once again, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic to get back in. Here's devastation. This is the Miracle House in Mystic Hills. Red tiled roofed house. Uh, but you'll, you'll see from Nancy uh, Lindsay's uh, video clip that uh, there were some, there, it hopscotched for some reason. 
this one was uh, survived. And the fire, firefighters will tell you that if a chance has a better chance of making it, that's where they'll put their effort in. So there's the uh, Miracle House in the hillside uh, of Mystic uh, Hills. I love you guys. There's the chimneys, the only structure still up. Now the fire burnt behind this building, behind City Hall. And behind uh, Fire Station 1. That's pretty close. Uh, Dana, as Kimberly said, Dana Point High School was the evacuation center. Here they've got the uh, Laguna Lies and Ashes, the LA Times to the right, and the Orange County Register, Inferno on the left. As I indicated, Thurston Middle School lost a building, so here's uh, students at Thurston. Here's an aerial uh, looking at Mystic Hills. Uh, Due to the fire, uh, there were improvements. We did have, um, uh, we, we got uh, the Orange County Fire Authority, that is, got two aerial firefighting helicopters. So even though Orange County at the time was the second largest county in population, uh, San Diego has passed us, uh, we didn't have any aerial firefighting uh, capability whatsoever. Uh, since then, we built uh, two three million gallon uh, water reservoirs of, at high elevation. We had been paying for years for an improved communication system, but it finally got installed for better communications, uh, particularly here with the canyons in Laguna Beach. Uh, the GOATs made a big difference, but the fuel modification zone in, uh, prior to 1993 was 50 <coughs> feet wide. They substantially uh, made that wider. And then the uh, Greater Laguna Coast Fire Safe Council uh, instituted a red flag program to be on dry days uh, out there uh, watching. So here's the Orange County helicopter program, which was started in June 1994. At that time, uh, they, they staffed one helicopter each day with a crew of two from the Fullerton Airport during daylight hours. Ready to go. Uh, it's a 350-gallon water tank, which can be filled from a fire engine or from a lake pond or the ocean. And so... Uh, Chief Holmes said that the uh, incident command staff believed immediate air support could have made the Laguna Fire manageable during the first quarter hour of its spread. Helicopters could have made water drops on the head of the fire. So um, uh, I think it's Chip Pather. Uh, uh, he was on the scene 14 minutes after the fire started, and all they could do was watch it. The uh, tankers um, and helicopters were getting their water out of Irvine Lake, a.k.a. Santiago Reservoir, and a little bit closer, Peters Canyon Reservoir in Tustin. Exactly. Just... <coughs> See, as I uh, set up your uh, video, okay. why don't you tell people about it so that if I'm... Uh, okay. Lost, I won't look at that. All right. Well, the day of the fire, I was at Costco with a sister, and we heard the fire started. And my sister, my other sister, lived on Vista Lane, off of Skyline Drive. And we go, we better go there and evacuate her. This was early in the day, and so we went all the way up to Skyline Drive and saw the fire come from the canyon into Emerald Bay, and. We went back to her house, and she goes, oh, I think it'll be contained. Don't worry. And so we waited a little bit longer. Her daughter came from the high school and said, they're evacuating everyone. They're coming to the high school. And so we went back to Skyline up on top, and we went, oh, my gosh, it's going to come down the canyon and across. 
and we saw it. And we go, we got to go back and evacuate her. And then the police started coming around and saying, you need to leave. So we left. And at the time, I lived in Dana Point, so they all came to my home. And we watched all the fires around in Ortega Highway. I mean, there was like seven different fires, it seemed like. And so my husband took the boat out, and he goes, I think the, the house went on fire because it was right on Vista Lane, but we didn't know. Anyway, so the next day, we drove around, and I took a video leaving her house off of Vista Lane, going up Skyline Drive, and then we turned left on Anna Kappa, kept going up to um, Pacific, and then to Coral and to Tahiti, and back down to Skyline. And my sister's son-in-law, Tyler Parks, had saved his family home, one of the only homes on Skyline Drive, um, because his parents were in Hawaii, and they told him, please go over and, you know, take care of our house. So he stayed up all night protecting the house. And so did my sister's neighbors. They stayed and protected their home as well. How um, is this you can see with the fire? They come down the hill and just... Now we're taking left on Anna Kappa. We're going down to Margaret Street. We're sharing this. This is where it all started on this rooftop. And this is across the canyon from Skyline Drive. It started uh, as far as you can see to the right. And all the way across, it came over these hills and into Laguna Beach. You can't even really see Laguna Beach today because it's kind of but all these homes are gone on this side. And this is the street that uh, Shannon's very good car, I think it's right now. And the home of it is gone. And all these homes. There are a couple of other homes on this boat this out. And all you can see here is the fire. Going back up on Skyline Drive. This is kind of um, this is the only home staying here on Skyline Drive that Tyler, Janice Brand, had 
and stayed up all night fighting the fires, and it's still standing. Everything around it is gone. It's gone. Everything. It's on Pacific Drive, the end. We called it that. <laughs> I, I think that's the Ingersoll's house. Oh. I think it's Temple, Temple Hill. I think it's Temple Hill. 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 That's his kid. He's an old friend. And then we're going to the last house. He's got a deal on that house. It's huge. <laughs> Look at all these houses. He never made it. We're from the park up here on the uh, top of the skyline. And you can just see how it just wrapped around and just came down the hill and took all the homes and the fires halfway. How it just, the wind would shift. And we get one house, it was like a cyclone or like a tornado up where you go. It's a beautiful sunny day today, the ocean is like glass. Yes, you want it, you can go at the end here. Top of uh, K Street on Vista. And you can see the roof line of uh, the Vinfords and then the dollhouse. <laughs> and then right below that is where the mudslide was and the canyon below them. But look at all the houses around. And then behind them, but it's just, it's gone. And then there's only like two houses that got kind of like two, two streets above them. And now you can see just one house above that street that's gone. And then you come up to the skyline and it's just totally unbelievable that all these beautiful homes with ocean views are gone. Lots of memories. There's Kay in the house, and I'll take the pictures for us. Nancy and I have been over here on this hillside. She's been here how many years? Good day. But how to all these new hiding places? This is a fair view. Well, I've checked it out before. I've got to see what was over here. And there's a little bit of a which is still standing. You can see how the fire just would go up to that ridge. I mean, it almost got This is Coral Street, I believe. What street is this? I believe this is Tahiti. Tahiti? Yes. Because that was the only house saved. Boo, Boo's house or Bo's house? So 
Tahiti is the street just below the Thurston Middle School going into Mystic Hills. Yes. Going back down, Skyline. That was it. <laughs> so come up to the lectern. Anybody would like to share any experiences? There is a switch under the side. Right here. Talk loud. There you go. Hello, on. we're on now. Okay. Hi, my name is John Keith. Um, at the time of the fire, I was a station captain at Fire Station in South Laguna. I was also president of the Orange County Firemen's Association at the time, and it helped Chief Holmes organize the Orange County Fire Associ Authority from what was the Orange County Fire Department. At the time of the fire, Orange County had two helicopters. They were equipped to carry water and put out this fire. The County Board of Supervisors refused to hire pilots for them, and they sat on the ground while our houses burned. At the same time, there was two aircraft at El Toro ready to go. But because the County of Orange had not arranged with the, through the state and the legal procedures that you have to do, they sat there. And it was four hours before those airplanes got in the air. Those two stunts cost us 400 homes. Chief Holmes fearing a lawsuit, said, oh, we did as good as we could. We didn't have any resources. They were all gone. That's not true. Chip Prather was my battalion chief, and I met with Chip uh, during the fires. I, I managed to come in Crown Valley Parkway, turn right, and drive into town. The police uh, let me go through. I had my fireman's uniform and turnouts in my car and said I was going to work. I was coming back to our house, of course, um, knowing that South Laguna has never burned and will probably never burn. Uh, it's just one of those isolated things where we're pretty lucky down there. I got home to a, a house full of friends from Canyon Acres who decided they perhaps would stay the night at our house instead of staying in their house. So uh, it was all in all a pretty interesting thing. The fire authority was going to uh, retrench as their last defense at Aliso Creek. They were going to let Laguna burn and the, the winds changed and so that disaster was somewhat mitigated. So that's it from my perspective. John, I have a question. Various helicopters, uh, there, there were two helicopters that were given by the Department of Defense. Yes, two Hueys. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. That in addition? Oh. Yeah, those were the ones and they sat there. Uh, we worked with uh, the county trying to get, the, and they, had, they said there's a hiring freeze, we can't hire pilots. And uh, those two Hueys sat there until after the fire, they f somehow hired pilots. There. The Riley. In 93, it would have been Harriet Weeder, uh, Riley. 
I said in 1993, it would have been Harriet Weeder from the second district, Thomas F. Riley, probably Phil Anthony was still in office, I think. You know, I. Uh, in the first I district. Um, might have been Ralph B. Clark still in the fourth district. And the third district was probably Bruce Nestandy by then, I think. It's ringing a bell. Um, John, a little question. I, I remember hearing tell that, that one of the contingencies was that they were going to, this is the wrong word, but it was the word that was bantered about, was that they were going to bomb Bluebird Canyon if they had to, to stop the fire from getting to Arch Beach Heights. Did you ever hear anything? No, they were, they were going to fight the fire as best they could, and then they were going to just draw the last line at Aliso Creek. At Aliso. And, and they... The fire department was very much aware of the fact that south of Aliso wouldn't burn because it's a coastal chaparral and it just doesn't, uh, despite our efforts to plant eucalyptus all over the place. Right. Which you probably shouldn't do. Although, interestingly enough, though, when the fire did jump the canyon, a lot of eucalyptus did not burn in Laguna Canyon. It, like out by the Boys and Girls Club and stuff, it just went right up. It, it had some interesting hops, you know. Yeah. Some of that, some of the ember carry was, you know, a quarter of a mile, and it just yeah. restarted. So it was, it's been an interesting study for the fire uh, personnel to look at what <clears throat> happened there. And then uh, let's see, because you have a view and you're close to Aliso Beach, my recollection is that the the, the great big um, gathering area where fire engines were parked down at Aliso was the soup kitchen and the resting area. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the rest of them were battling it out up here, but that's where they went to rest. And yeah, there was a lot of rest at uh, Liso because it's a county park. Yeah. There's no money charged for parking there. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> you have to understand how the county works, you know. I have a question. I, yeah. That picture that Gene showed where I didn't realize the hill behind us was burned. I mean, it came right down here. Yeah. Uh, was there a serious concerned that all of downtown was in danger i mean yes is weird i mean yes that was a, i mean it came around the corner it lost some steam coming around the corner because there's less wind on that side but uh yeah there was serious concern at the time it was coming down there there was probably 20 or 30 fire engines parked on main beach wow they they beat a hasty retreat you know they went south wow. in a big hurry um Luckily, it, it lost a lot of steam when it gets out of the wind. If you can get rid of the wind factor, you have a lot better chance with the fire. And it, and it did when it got around the corner. A day or two after the fire, Chief Dewberry gave a report to the city council. And um, at some point, I, I turned to my wife and I said, did he say what I just thought he said? Because part of the report was that they had decided to abandon the downtown. Yeah. And to make their, at this point, was to make their stand at Temp Temple Hills Drive. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I, I asked my wife, I said, did he really say that? Really? Yes. Yeah. Wow. They, they didn't think they could defend downtown. Uh, because, you know, you have canyon after canyon. What John just said, making a stand at Aliso uh, Creek, there are so many canyons between now, between uh, here and Aliso, it would have been uh, thousands of homes. And of course, you know, just a couple years before the Laguna wildfire was the Berkeley Hills fire, where um, uh, over 2,000 2, homes were destroyed and quite a bit of uh, loss of life. I forget if it was 24 deaths, but some uh, not insignificant number. So, uh, so it can happen. Uh, is anybody standing yeah, behind so John? Yes. No, you yeah. can't. You've got to come up to the podium. Oh, come up. Come up. <laughs> All right, I'll repeat the question. <laughs> do we have any idea of how to figure out if it's an arson fire and how do we go about identifying that? Uh, yes, we have a serious. Orange County Fire Authority has, at the time, a dozen fire investigators. And they actually go out to the start of the fire. They look for simple things like incendiary devices. They look at the spread of the fire. How could it have started here? Are there multiple starts to the fire? An arsonist will sometimes light three or four 
areas. So they have a real good idea how the fire starts. And it's, it's pretty easily identified. I, I was, my first fire with, a, with an investigator was a, a house up the street for me. And we went downstairs and you could see these interesting scallops where the guy had thrown gasoline on the wall before he let it on fire. And some of them are real simple to do that like that, but the, the wildland fires, they can pretty much tell. Um, as far as finding them, it's eyewitnesses. Um, right now, the, the city of Laguna Beach is looking into a few more cameras in the wildland area, and the cameras are a real deterrent, number one, and number two, it can help identify. So we're actually trying to, to do that right now. I, I serve on a disaster preparedness committee, and we're looking into some camera assist. So anyway, I don't mean to hog it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was sure. great. Thank you. I'm Mike Rohde. I'm a retired fire battalion chief with the Orange County Fire Authority. And with me tonight are three additional retired battalion chiefs, Steve Whitaker, Mark Hawkins, and Don Forsyth. <laughs> Uh, collectively, uh, we were the commanders of the Laguna Fire, not the top commander, but the, I was the planning section chief in charge of the strategy and planning for the fire. Steve was the operations commander in charge of the tactics, and Don and Mark led uh, strike teams deployed to structure protection in the hillsides in Emerald Bay and Laguna Beach. Uh, so we have a very intimate uh, and uh, deep-seated feelings and, and memories of the Laguna Fire. Matter of fact, 20 years after the fact, I can say uh, absolutely this was the most significant fire of our careers. And uh, I can tell you that that's saying quite a bit because we've all fought and commanded fires throughout the Western United States. Uh, the four of us are recognized for our abilities and structural fire protection in the wildland urban interface and we're specialists in that regard and this fire uh, was simply uh, remarkable amazing and breathtaking in its uh, in its uh, damage and its in its proportions uh, the day that we were faced with it uh, the, the fire occurred uh, the second day of a Santa Ana wind episode uh, you've heard a lot about the whether or not resources were available. Uh, a quirk of nature is that the coastal areas of Southern California, Laguna Beach, San Diego, places like that are the last to receive the Santa Ana winds. The inland canyons and passes, the Santa Claritas, the Cabazons, the Cajon passes get the winds much earlier. And all those areas with the onset of the winds got their fires earlier as well. And there were 26 major wildland fires during the same period of time as the Laguna Fire. Uh, unfortunately, 14 of them were burning prior to the Laguna Fire's ignition. And when it came time to request resources, they were all committed. Uh, someone had a question about the Fort Bragg engine. There were so many fires already burning that resources were already being mobilized for what was expected to be further fires occurrence in Southern California when the, when the uh, Laguna Fire started. But that still left us with hours to go before resources were going to be pulling into Southern California to augment what we have here. The only resources were available for the Laguna Fire came out of Orange County, the cities and the county fire department uh, at that time. And uh, we were faced with the worst fire in the county's history. There have been some close to it, the freeway fire in Yorba Linda, but nothing like the Laguna fire in its intensity or the dramatic spread that, it, that we were faced with that day. Uh, an all-out effort was initially made to protect Emerald Bay. Uh, we had to do that with uh, uh, 25 to 30 fire engines. That was all that we could muster out of the county. Uh, we had over uh, 200 homes ignited within the first 15 minutes of the flames onslaught there. Uh, we went on uh, to have the fire start to enroach on Laguna Canyon Road itself, and we know from past fire history that at the, at the Big Bend, the fire is going to jump the road. And there was barely enough time to position resources there to watch the fire indeed do exactly that. I was over the fire then with a helicopter and watched the fire jump in multiple places. 
and start its run on downtown Laguna. Now, Gene, uh, one correction, uh, I don't want to challenge perhaps what your memory might remember from 20 years back, but uh, we did make a concerted effort on downtown Laguna. Uh, we took everything we had, uh, and all the resources that were available, and put them in the area of the fire station and the city hall to stop the fire from proceeding down into further into downtown Laguna and into the high school area, primarily because we had a massive traffic jam there, a population that had not been evacuated yet, and we were afraid of the loss of life. As a matter of fact, the, the, the fact that we got through this day with no loss of life is just remarkable and a testament to yeah. our good luck. Yeah. The Laguna Fire uh, served uh, a, a major purpose in, in the fire service in California. Uh, for me, it was a significant event. I, I got my master's degree writing about it, my thesis. Uh, there have been many classes that have been uh, developed as a result of that. Fire commanders now on their way up uh, uh, have to go through a class about wildland urban interface fires and the lessons of the Laguna Fire stand still today for uh, chiefs to uh, reflect upon and to understand. And, and uh, the lessons learned here have been used on many, many fires since. Uh, Orange County is, uh, I forgot this gentleman's name. I remember you're a reserve firefighter from Station 6, right? Uh, I, remember, I remember your face. <laughs> uh, we did have uh, aircraft that had been uh, recently acquired from the military as federal excess, but they were not equipped to even fly. They weren't even flight worthy at the time we had them. So even if we had pilots back then, we were just getting in the business, and the Board of Supervisors wasn't quite convinced that we even needed them. We had them kind of stashed in a hangar, and we were getting ready to put a, an effort forward. Other counties, like Los Angeles, had them. Uh, one of the, you know, Chief Holmes was absolutely correct in his statements that uh, had we had aircraft available earlier, uh, we might have made a major difference here. But uh, that's, you know, our situation, and that's where we are today. Uh, it's important to reflect that in 20 years uh, since, that that area is completely regenerated. Uh, that fire could happen again. It's important for the community to understand that uh, uh, we have to have a fire safe community, that our, our homes need to be protected in advance of the fire, and that our fire safe construction standards and our fire clearance has to be maintained if we're to avoid a catastrophe again. Uh, the planning that goes into uh, fire safety today and the fire safe councils is essential. Uh, the evacuation we pulled off on the gun was miraculous. It, it saved a lot of lives. And uh, uh, it's just the nature of where we live. It's the nature of the beautiful environment around us that we have to be prepared for the next one. So uh, anyway, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of all my friends who are still wondering why I'm talking back there, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And Chief, there's a you. question from a gentleman. Yes, sir. What were some of the operational things that you learned from that fire? Uh, some of the command strategies, the way that we would deploy resources and organize ourselves for uh, firefighting under these circumstances have to be different than uh, other, other kinds of fires that we fight. Uh, we were able to understand that by comparing the Laguna Fire with other fires like the Oakland Hills fires and a different way of uh, commanding those fires and organizing for them and deploying for them was developed that makes us more effective. Uh, we also uh, recognize the benefit of aircraft. Orange County now has four helicopters uh, that, uh, uh, and, and a stronger relationship with military assets and other things that, to augment that. Uh, we have a stronger relationship for mutual aid that allows us to mobilize resources even more quickly. Uh, budget has been tough uh, to maintain those those kinds of firefighting assets. As a matter of fact, some of the assets that we would like to have today, uh, we had stronger assets in 93 when the fire occurred, to be frank with you, uh, than what the budget can maintain today. But uh, we, we've learned quite a bit about this fire. As a matter of fact, this fire has been categorized to, to meet one of, there's a kind of almost a pattern that these kinds of fires follow. And if you're a fire chief sitting in the back of your car trying to command this, certain things will start to happen that are repetitive with other major fires that have occurred like this. 
And once you're in that pattern, you'll recognize it because it's the worst day of your life coming at you. And uh, once these things start to fall in place, we can predict that the rest of the bad day is going to come with it, and we can organize for it. And uh, a lot more understanding, a lot, a lot better training, uh, a lot better equipment. What don't we have today that we did have? What, what don't we have today? Well, firefighting is an expensive business, and uh, aircraft, uh, fixed-wing aircraft in particular, uh, back in, in uh, the 90s, we had 40 to 50 aircraft nationally. We're down to about 12 today. Um, uh, hand crews, we used to have a lot, of, a lot more inmate populations that would give us crews that could come out and do some of the manual labor on fires and dig the fire lines. A lot fewer of those are around. Uh, firefighters, in particular, are expensive also to, to have on, on a tax roll, and uh, we've seen efforts to reduce that as well. But we're still in a good place of preparedness, but it's it's different. Chief, there's a question in the back. Glenna? Um, I wasn't here in 93, but I was in Berkeley in 91, and that was uh, horrific. I mean, 2,000 homes. It was like being killed. Um, and I'm wondering what lessons, or any lessons applied from that fire to Well, as a matter of fact, that tall gentleman back there, Steve, uh, was the Orange County representative we sent to Berkeley to study that, and he became the operations commander of the Laguna Fire the day that it occurred. That's great. Good question, Glenna. Hey, Mike. Uh, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, yeah, app. please come to the microphone if you wouldn't mind. They, they created, okay. This will be quick. Oh. They created a uh, several pre-fire um, programs, and then everybody shuddered because it's based on tax. And they even have goats up there doing it. And 25 fatalities. Oh, I know. People oh, yeah. just died in the street. And it, it was miraculous down here that nobody, we had no fatalities. But they had um, fire state councils that were developed. Uh, they have free, and for instance, uh, folks uh, clean your yard, and you get the debris out to the street. They provide a free chipper. They haul it away, and, and they've been very successful. But it's they kept it separate from the fire department and the fact that it is a, a program all in itself. But it's it's based on a subscription for each parcel. You can go online for the Oakland um, City website, and you can uh, look at what they've done. Our big concern, we had this chat. You're on TV. We had this, uh, we had this chat um, at dinner tonight. And, you know, the big concern that we're, we were yakking about is, um, is South Laguna. And, um, you know, I, all you need to do is take a ride up through there and, and take a look and see if this could repeat itself with a fire coming out of Woods Canyon. Uh, under a Santa Ana wind, you know, and I would say that yeah, it definitely could. And so not to be an alarmist or anything, but it, the, these fires can be predicted, and all you have to do is look at the uh, the areas. Uh, Panorama Heights, you know, North Tustin area, heavily, heavily vegetated with ornamental vegetation. With ornamental vegetation, eucalyptus trees that John mentioned. Um, I mean, uh, look what's going on in Australia right now. Uh, so what, what, what I would say, these fire safe councils, Mike was instrumental in, in creating a pre-flat fire plan for the city of Laguna Beach. Mike, keep me straight here. That uh, identifies a multitude of things, but, but a lot of it is, is defensible space. You guys have to provide defensible space for your properties in order to give firefighters even a fighting chance. And that up here and right behind... Um, the fire station here, is it Mystic Hills? Is that what they call it? Um, I mean, if you look at the vegetation that was there then, it's uh, certainly thinned out now. You know, I mean, the, 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 they, they've, they've gotten real good with the building codes. And uh, I know that water was a huge, huge problem for us on that day. We had to go down to Pacific Coast Highway to use a hydrant because all the reservoirs were, uh, were basically drained. You know, and that was, that was a huge uh, event up there. So... Without further ado, I'll pass this off. I'd like to ask Bonnie a 
from um, this, I, when I left my home with my father who was incapacitated with a stroke and ready to go to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota with three days later for heart surgery, um, we left the house, we're pulling out of the driveway somewhere between 4.30 and 5 p.m. that day. When I came around the turn at Hill Edge, this whole hillside was in flame. I could not see that even from my home. Looking out to the ocean, it was clear blue sky and water. The winds were being blown sort of toward the north, up North Coast Highway. But my concern has been all these years was getting out of town. From our house going right down um, Bluemont to Park Avenue, I looked up to the high school, the flames I could see at this point. Numerous fire trucks were parked there uh, it was basically, there wasn't much they could do. I mean, they were sort of, that was staying there to protect it and stop it there, my assumption. It took us 45 minutes to get from that location at, by the high school, Hill Edge and Park Avenue and Bluemont to Thalia and Coast Highway, 45 minutes. Um, it was bumper to bumper. The smoke was getting so thick, my father was having trouble breathing because of his heart problem. And finally, at one point, there, there were one lane going south, one lane open to come north, and the middle lane was set for emergency vehicles. A police car came zooming through the middle, and because of my dad, I needed to get, I just pulled in behind the fire, the police, and followed down a mile or something, and then got out of the line. Okay, but my concern was the timing. I didn't see, personally, any traffic control at all. I got all the way down to Crown Valley. Every car was stopped at Crown Valley on Coast Highway, being asked, do you want to go into Crown Valley or keep going south? My feeling has always been that someone should have been standing there, just keep going, go, 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 and just tell them to head on down Coast Highway. But everyone had to stop at Crown Valley. It took us two hours to get to Dana Point. Two uh, hours, and that's not exaggerating. You know, uh, you brought up a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Uh, most people keep an eye on the big fire. Yeah. And uh, what happened here right above, uh, they did backfire right behind the fire station, but the reason they did is because spot fires that were blown ahead of the main fire landed on the hillside above here a good mile in front of the main fire and ignited this hillside almost cutting off the evacuation of the skyline area and uh, we had a lot of people start to get trapped along Park Avenue okay. and uh, if anybody's ever seen the uh, video of the Oakland Hills fire they had a similar event there where they actually had fatalities thankfully we didn't yes. people were able to get out of that area you have to remember that the Laguna fire started after the stagecoach fire in the Anaheim Hills, and, and about halfway through the afternoon on the Laguna fire, we also had the Ortega fire uh, start. And law enforcement was as stripped as fire service. So it was very problematic to manage the evacuation of Laguna with the limited amount of law enforcement that was available during the, the height of the fire. Uh, the, the good news is since then, you know, one of the lessons learned from that is exactly the understanding of the problem you're talking about, about uh, evacuations, that we have to plan those in advance and we have to notify people as quickly as possible. Things like reverse 911 exist today that we didn't have back then. Uh, you, know, you know, the digital world can help us out there a little bit. Uh, we also have those pre-fire plans that Mark was talking about now that help us channel and evacuate people more quickly to pre-identified evacuation areas. And, uh, you know, I can't say that in the panic of another fire that we wouldn't have problems again. It's kind of the nature to have that kind of a problem, especially while the fire is trying to cut people off as you're trying to make your way out of town. The most important thing is, if you hear the, the recommendation to evacuate, that you act on that immediately and you, and you take steps to leave. And if you've been reading up and you're a hillside dweller and you, you've got your plan in your hand, 
you know, dust that thing off annually and know where you're supposed to go and head that direction, you know, with your emergency bag or whatever you prepared in your home. And uh, don't, don't wait around to be the last person out the door. It may be a, a real risk for you. Yeah. I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, please come up to the lectern. We'd like to hear uh, your thoughts, what happened to you that day. Let us know your name. My name is Lynn Lindsay. No relation. We're EYs, not AYs, but it's lovely to see someone with the same name. And on that particular day, we lived on Canyon Acres, in the corner of Canyon Acres and Llewellyn, in a little tiny old home that had been there since 1934. It had been through fires. It had been through floods. We'd lived there since 1976. They'd always put out those fires. So at the point in time that we left, the last thing on our mind was that it was going to burn down. My biggest issue was, oh, I have to put all this stuff away when I get back and when they get the fire put out. Now, I brought my grandson up to model this fine t-shirt that I dug out of a corner of my closet. I told him he gets to wear it this one night only <laughs> because it's never been worn before. And it was designed by our neighbors and good friends across the street, Gabrielle Harwood. And they had them like, I see the ones up here too. Now you may go sit down. <laughs> Now, you can tell he wasn't alive then because those of us who were there were known by our Stussy and Bum t-shirts. Now, if you don't know what that is, see, you got to have this little card. I still carry it in my wallet. This said, yep, your house burned down, you get free stuff. And we'd go there and we'd pick up these t-shirts donated from the bum t-shirt company and the Stussy t-shirt company. And boy, we wore those proudly. And you knew it was like a giant club here in town. Now, the day that it happened before anything actually burned, my grandson's dad, my son, sitting in the back back there, was a sophomore at the high school sitting in math class when his good friend went by in second period and said, hey, my mom's a night nurse. She's home asleep, and the canyon's on fire, dude. We better go. I have to wake her up. So he left the class, got in their car, had to abandon it at the city hall because they wouldn't let anybody go out that way. They ran down. Now, I'm a school teacher, and I was in class that day, way down in Dana Point. I could see the smoke, but we, they always put it out. So he's running home, and he's saying to himself, he tells me later, oh, man, if the fire doesn't kill me, my mom will, because I left school without permission, and I'm going to be in so much trouble. Well, we all did come back. We all did leave. We all did get in our car, and it took us three hours to get to Crown Valley. But it was a celebration, I hate to say it almost, because you were going so slow, you'd see your neighbor across the way, hey, where are you going? People could get out of their car, walk up and down the line, talk to each other, get back in the car and go, ain't it awful? But hey, where are you going? Well, we heard the Ritz was full. Otherwise, we'd have gone there too. But we heard it was free. That was the word on the road. They were letting people stay there for nothing. Well, we didn't get in on that. But luckily, we had family. In coming back, poking around in the ashes, was still a little bit of smoke coming up. And on Canyon Acres, I mean, every garden, every fence around us was just gone. There was no sense of property, no sense of where one started and one stopped. And by golly, there were two men in my yard, not knowing it was my yard, and they were setting up video equipment. And I could tell they were news people. So I said, what news station are you from? And they said, oh, you wouldn't know. I said, I watch a lot of TV. I used to. And they said they were from Argentina. They proceeded to set up. They never talked to me again. I just dug over in the ashes. But I heard the words. Now, my Spanish reflects my high school grades in Spanish. I know it not. But I did understand the words when they got to 
La devastación de Canyonakers. And I went, oh my goodness, people all over the world are seeing this. It was an amazing, amazing time. It really brought our neighborhood together. Those, the saddest people were the people whose houses did not burn. They were the people who were tearful because they couldn't fix it for us. We were just getting stuff together. I've said it's a time when people give you money for nothing. We'd walk down the street and get in a line and somebody would hand you a $300 check. Oh, what are they giving away over in that line? And off you'd go. Of course, you had no place to put anything if you bought anything, so you really couldn't. Not yet. People are kind to you, no matter who you are or what you've done. And you didn't do anything to deserve it. For heaven's sakes, your house burned down. And you get a brand new house out of it. We had insurance. It was great. But then I say, I would trade it all if I could get my high school yearbook back. Thank you. Hello, Nancy Lindsay's my sister. I'm Kay in the video. And Tyler Parks, 21, saved his parents' house, was in the front page of the paper. My daughter was a sophomore at Laguna Beach High School, and she told me he was 19. <laughs> so I got to read it firsthand in the paper, just like your parents did when you were that young, and you did something wrong, but they said, hey, wait a minute. Well, Tyler Parks is my son-in-law, and I love him very much. I'm fortunate. I was home that day because I was sick from work, and my sisters did wake me up. And I thought, oh, I don't need anything. <laughs> they said, oh, we get everything out of the house. My daughter needed to get some things out. I said, it's time, honey. You've got to get what we need. Whatever you want, please take it. She took her prince's phone and her cheerleading outfits, and that's all she took from the house. She was happy. We came back the next day and we got escorted by the police because my house stood and uh, they took us down and it was just devastation. Unbelievable. It was like a war went off. Everything was gone. Amazing. But like you said that, you know, it puts the family back together. The neighbors, everybody was so close after that. It was amazing. I know we had, I had two phones in my house, and believe it or not, one phone worked and one didn't. But I told all the neighbors, come and use my phone. I didn't charge them any money. Um, <laughs> so they all were able to communicate with their family because there were no cell phones for us because we lived on the hillside. They did not work. And we all became together. What is nice is Tyler Park's parents still live in that house on Skyline Drive. And his neighbors asked him, what did you do? that made your house stand. And it's amazing, he cleared off the trees. He has small trees in his yard. He lives on the hillside. Um, he co covered his eaves so that they wouldn't get any leaves or anything that would burn. And Tyler did spend the night and he saved his parents' house. And they're very grateful for it because it is so hard to say that your house burned down. But theirs did not, neither did mine. So I'm very fortunate because of my sisters, we were able to move out because I had no knowledge of the fire in the canyon. Thank you. To add just a few more personal notes of that evening, um, I mentioned that my home was and is on Mystic Way at the lower part of it. Um, I left, as I said, with my father at the time flames were going up the hill above City Hall. My brother, though, stayed to look after the house the best he could, and he had his escape route right down the hill by the high school and down you know, Park Avenue if necessary. But he saved our house that night. He got up on the roof with towels soaked in water because there was no water at all available, no water pressure. And we had a wood shingle roof and the winds were blowing the wind 
uh, the burning shingles from up higher on the hill out to the sea, and they were catching on some of our older shingle, you know, right under the edges, and he would take these wet towels and smother it before it, it ever hit flames. Uh, when he, the toilet water in on the house ran out, he remembered that back when we had an earthquake scare in Southern California, some 10 or so years before that, I had bought a six pack down at Lucky's uh, Market where they sold those gallon jugs of water and a six pack and I had stored it under the stairs in our home. So he found in the dark, went down and found where I had stored that, took two of those gallons up onto the roof and he used those to keep the towels wet to smother whenever he saw a shingle. And I believe that did save the house. He was able to observe Clay Anderson's house, Clay's house, just was around the corner and on the next higher street. And he saw it catching on fire at one corner from the burning embers. There was nothing he could do on our roof down the distance. And the fire crept across the front of the house. And then with the added time, it ultimately burned down. Um, so it was, anyway, it was obviously a scary time, and um, luckily then the winds turned and, and our house didn't burn. But in our area, one house below us on a hill below burned because something caught on fire from the winds. At the end of our street, toward the city hall area, another house burned there. Again, it had to do with the winds and chance. The trees, the pine trees, the other kinds of trees, I saw no tree burning damage when we returned, um, you know, a day and a half later. So the wind was blowing those burning embers, but even through trees, they just kept blowing. So that's just one more tidbit of personal touch. Thank you. Thank you. I was with the fire department on that day. I was with the emergency communications team for Laguna Beach, and we were all ham radio operators. I was at work on, in my office on Mermaid Street, and I saw up my window a fire truck parked on top of the mountain on the north side of town overlooking Emerald Bay. <clears throat> I was looked at it and wondered what was that doing there? Then I as I was watching it it took off and just after it took off a uh, the uh, fire leaped over the hill and came down this direction and I said uh oh I better get down to the forest department and get on the radios <clears throat> and um, Got in there, there was no one in the fire department. They were all out fighting the fire. And, and I walked in, and all the radios were going, and, and um, calls were coming in. And there's too many calls coming in. I, so I didn't answer the phones. I just answered the, the radio calls coming in. And they were all um, fire companies that had got released from duty up in Anaheim Hills. And they were heading down to Laguna Beach needing directions. And they were having to rely on Thomas Brothers guides. And in Laguna Beach, that's not very good. It, uh, it doesn't indicate how steep the road is or even exists. And um, also, it doesn't tell you uh, how wide the roads are. Some of these roads up on our hills are very narrow. So, <clears throat> I was, some of the other radio operators came in, and and the uh, fire companies coming to town. needed better directions than what they could get from the Thomas Brothers guide. So I 
told him just to come down, make a left on, and end up in front of the fire department, and uh, and I'll run out and give you directions to the best location to head to. Make sure you don't head up in a on Third Street. So. Uh, <clears throat> We were in there answering all the calls coming in and finding out where they would be needed and send them. And uh, as he mentioned earlier, some of the fire companies were coming in from long distances. Uh, I took note, one was from Yuma, out of state. And uh, We uh, then then the uh, radio stopped working and went out tracked down the problem that the fire had come back had come to the back of the fire department and the, the heat fried the uh, our antenna cables and so we went to work on fixing those and uh, to get the city's. Uh, communication system back up. We were not yet on that new type of frequency, which is an interface with the other cities. And um, we then um, I was working on that, and we thought the fire came down the street here. And uh, we were not firefighters, we were radio operators. And and all that was left that was there for us to use to fight the fire <clears throat> right here behind the fire department was city's garden hoses. So we uh, Us old timers grabbed the garden hoses, and some two little kids came up, about 12 years old, and said they're here here to help. And um, it turned out that the little kids had were um, fire explorers, and had been trained and knew how to connect up the fire hoses. So they got the city's fire hoses out connected them up and and put out the fire down the street and uh, one roof was already in, involved in a fire down down the street so help came from some unusual sources wow that's an amazing story thank you ron I'm Seal Sharman, and we live three doors down from what they call the Miracle House. And um, the day of the fire, I was up in LA with my students. And as we drove on the school bus back to Newport Beach, where I, where I um, taught, I got off the bus and all the parents said, Seal, Seal, go home, Laguna's burning. So I couldn't come down the coast like I normally come. I came down Crown Valley, or down 405 in Crown Valley back up. And we ended up staying with friends that night down in Dana Point. It did take three hours to get back from where I was able to get to park and went was as far as I could get. And I looked up and I saw the ring of fire. But the next day, we were able to hitchhike back into town because they weren't letting cars in when we were trying to get in. And it took us about three or four rides I remember we saw one taxi driver that rode, drove us several blocks. And I said, oh, we better, they'll gouge us in a, in a disaster. They'll gouge us. We better not do that. Well, he drove us free up to the bottom of Park Avenue, and we walked up Park. And we started down Tahiti, which was our street. And the first few houses were fine. And we walked, and we tiptoed and thought, maybe, maybe we're okay. And then we rounded the bend of Tahiti, and it was just total devastation after that. 
with the exception there were the plumes from the gas jets were still burning. So there was like a parade of these gas jets all the way down. So we get to our house and we had a slumpstone wall in front and that protected our car somewhat that was out here. And Fred decided to try and start the car. I said, no, no, the car's going to explode. Don't start it. So he gets in and it actually turned over, but it never ran again after that. So we stood on the wall with our head on our, on our arms. And my husband has a wonderful sense of humor, particularly in a catastrophe, catastrophe, and that's his way of coping. He said, well, I guess we can cancel that roofer that we called to come and fix the roof. <laughs> and you don't have to bug me anymore about fixing the garage door. And you know, you really wanted to paint the house? Scratch that. So he was able to call his school in Anaheim to report that he wasn't going to come in because there was a CNN car that was right behind us and they were in photographing us and all this and um, but I think my long-term memory is similar to what other people have spoken to is how incredibly wonderful people are I mean neighbors came friends came from Laguna they helped us sift through the rubble to see if we could find any jewelry or anything we did find one thing the diamond from my engagement ring and it was in a little box and the gold had all melted away, but the diamond was there. And my daughter-in-law now wears that diamond. People helped us sift. People helped us dig. People brought us clothes. The Presbyterian Church became the mecca for food, for toasters, for housing, for whatever you can imagine. The Buddhists came there and gave $300 just flat out to anybody who had lost a house. The people from the uh, Latter-day Saints Church came, and they were helping. They, they had a, I called it Boutique Laguna. Nordstrom's and some of the nicer stores had donated truckloads of clothes. And they set that up in the parlor of the Presbyterian Church. Then they had a, a personal shopper who would take us around and they'd help us find our right sizes and our right clothes. And so it was just amazing how people came together. My, our old babysitting co-op had a shower for three of us that had lost our houses. Our schools had showers for us. We have friends back east, they had a barn raising for us. And they gave me wacky earrings because they know I like earrings. And they gave my husband Hawaiian shirts and they gave us Christmas ornaments. And so my long-term memory of the fire is how incredibly wonderful people are. And I'm sure some of you are among them, so thank you. had the help from people that had gone through the disaster a year before, two years before. That was really outstanding. That was the other thing. People banded together. You know, we had groups that got together that were, were strategizing how to deal with this in terms of insurance and all this. And, and the Oakland people gave us a book that was published there that Fred has later been involved in helping further publish. And it lists everything that you have in your house. I mean, from every toothpick, every paper clip, everything, so that when you're filing your claim, it kind of triggers your memory, you know, what, what to ask for and what, what to remember that you had. So um, that was another real big help. Thank you. I have never talked in a microphone before. But either way, my name is Chris Sean, and my mom's the lady that was up here with my son, um, Margaret, or Lynn Lindsay. And she was, I was going to elaborate a little bit more on her st story about the day that it happened. You know, I was a sophomore at the high school, and this is when the fire is like, I want to say, out in Ortega Highway or something like that was burning. So the, high sc the sky was all hazy. And we didn't think anything of it. And then fifth period, my friend comes in. Because two of my friends who went to the high school are two kids that I grew up with on my street. And um, he comes in and says, the canyon's on fire. So we all take turns going out to talk to the one family member we knew that was still on the street. And then that's when my two friends, we kind of said, forget it. And we just kind of jumped in the car and left. And, of course, we had to park up here by the high school. And they were both athletes. And I was not disabled back then. But they were both athletes, and they smoked cigarettes. I did not. But running from between here to up Canyon Acres, I felt like I'd smoked like a pack. 
just running along there, you know, and then I got inside the house, and I was the first one there, and, you know, first I tried to get the animals collected, you know, we had a dog and two cats, and I had a snake, and my brother had an iguana, and I had an iguana, and I got those out the fastest I could, but either way, I tried to put the cats both in one carrier, and my brother had this big white cat, and this little black, I had a little black cat, and I tried to put the big cat and the black cat together, and they started fighting, and the big cat just took off, so I kind of said, okay, what could I do, you know, and then my mom, and then I started trying to, you know, first I went outside and tried spraying water on the roof. I realized it's not going to do much. So I go inside to side, start collecting stuff. And um, we had a skylight in our living room. And I remember first looking at the TV, seeing my house on the TV, thinking, wow, I'm famous. And I look up the skylight, and maybe 10% of it was smoke. The rest of it was like 9% blue sky. And then 10 minutes later, it was half and half. And 20 minutes later, it was just pure smoke. And... I don't know. I mean, it was in interesting, to put it mildly. But, yeah, I remember it took us like three hours just to get down to Pico in San Clemente, you know, where my dad's sister lived. But I don't know. <laughs> I apologize. I don't know. I'm not very comfortable talking to groups of people. But anyway, I'm going to step out. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm um, Joe Johnson, and I live in the Eucalyptus Grove at Old Top of the World. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, I used to live at the bottom of a nice place, and my house got hit nine times with runaway cars. And one of them was a crash and burn, a Carmen Ghia, into the garage. And just to tip, um, if you ever call in an emergency, make sure the person Here's your whole statement, because I was cut off. By the time my shaky finger hit the right numbers, somebody had, you know, called me prior to me, and she reported an auto accident, but no fire and no home. And just prior to that, my father-in-law had some leftover water-based paint, and that seemed to have saved the interior of my garage that would have, would have gone up. Because the firemen, when they came around the corner, said it was, you were within minutes of having the house blow up. But that water-based paint and an old wooden garage that was built in 1920 bought me three minutes, he said. So remember that. Try and get the whole spiel out before you hang up <laughs> so they know what's involved. Um, my father-in-law... Um, kept his radio on 24-7 in the garage because he had been through a lot of fires. So he was the first one who heard about the fire in my family, and he lived in San, Diego, uh, San Clemente. And he jumped in the car with my dear mother-in-law and drove up and got the kids out of the, out of the area for me. I was a nanny at the time, and I was responsible for another family's kids. So I had to go to three different schools and take care of that. Um, my husband happened to be driving out the canyon and saw the fire start. Saw someone throw something out of the car. He realized, you know, further on what was happening. Tried to get into El Toro at that point, road. It had already passed El Toro. All he did was, I mean, it was that fast. Tried to go down to Crown Valley to get into the, into the um, town, and by that time, the, Crown Valley was close too. So he thought we were all stuck in town. He didn't realize his parents had gone. Um, I'm a gardener, and I live in a house that's 70 years old, a little redwood house with way too many eucalyptus around it. But one thing I use is heavy, heavy bales of peat moss. And I know this is probably laughable in hindsight, but when the fire period, the Santa Ana's come, I, I would make a point to stick a garden hose, make a little small hole in the top of these. The bales are three feet wide, three feet tall. And once they've been filled with water, they weigh a ton. But I managed to haul those up onto my redwood decks and put about eight inches of wet peat all on the decks, and when I came back after the fire, I had 
shingles that had flown through the air and had landed on that peat and not set that house on fire. They were just sitting on the wet peat, peat moss. Um, by the time I left my area, um, my neighborhood temple was closed, and I had helped some neighbors get their cars loaded, and we headed for the fire road. That is a private street. It's locked. It was locked. There was no exit. Um, I went back and got a sledgehammer and broke the lock, and about a dozen cars left. At the other end was a cop in a car smoking a cigarette. And I said, you realize that gate was locked? <laughs> and I've tried to approach the city about that solution. I mean, it's going to happen again. Who's going to open that gate? It's a real issue for me because I don't believe that a fire road should be locked. I do not believe there should be a private road there. It's just, it's crazy. But because of lawsuits and courts and whatever, those people have their private road and it's going to stay that way. But for people who live on a hill or like in Bluebird Canyon, you're, you're trapped. Um, the, the last thing that I, I wish was, and maybe it is, but I wish the building permits would insist that every house in Laguna have an automatic gas shut off. It's a $25 part, and it costs 45 for a plumber to install it. And it shuts off in a shake, and you can reset it. It's, they've made progress in that. And the gas company really wants everyone to do it, but initially it wasn't resettable except by them. And so they, they stopped insisting people have it. But anyway, um, I was blessed to go to in-law's house that night, and, and I concur with we live in a wonderful town. Thank you. My name is Nancy Wessel. I live on Went Terrace. I was working that day in San Juan Capistrano, but when I left for work at about 6.30 in the morning, my husband, who was an Orange County lifeguard, decided to let me know that the day was a hot day, and I should be well equipped with water. So I have him to thank that I was hydrated, and luckily the phone system in San Juan still worked at my home. My husband was going to be to work, and um, he said, remember that it's his hot as a popcorn fart. And I chuckled about that when I got home at about 3.30 in the morning. I spent the night in San Juan Capistrano and snuck in on Crown Valley Parkway. I'll just never forget what an awesome sight I saw. Different colored fire trucks, red, yellow, green, red, even a white fire truck on, on PCH coming into town. It was lit with the fire and the smog and the fog and the, it was surreal coming into town almost all by myself. I, I still had my postal uniform on and um, luckily there were people at the corner of Crown Valley and PCH and uh, I had my driver's license with me and said that I was going to work and saw my postal uniform and let me through and People on my route in San Juan Capistrano were telling me at 2.30, 3 o'clock, oh, Laguna's 
in trouble. Everybody could see the fire coming over the hills, and uh, we were even on television at, uh, by the time I was off work at 5 o'clock. And it was, it was truly an interesting time to be in Laguna in the middle of the night because people were out trying to help other people get home or help, help with, um, help the firefighters find lost dogs and coming together was what Laguna was really wonderful about. So I want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart that uh, we're still here and we're still telling our stories. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, line up behind him. Come on. Gene, I want to thank you and I want to thank the panel here for letting us all kind of vent and say our feelings. Those of us who experienced the fire, really it was a turning point in our life before the fire, our life after the fire. I don't want to so much talk about the fire per se. Uh, but what I would like to say is that uh, one of the things I did, and I'm not saying it was brilliant, I just happened to do it, uh, about three months, four months before the fire, was go through and videotape everything in my house. And uh, I then put the videotape down in a bank uh, downtown. That proved to be one of the most invaluable experiences, and I would encourage each and every one of you who are concerned at all that this could strike again to do that first. Secondly, uh, uh, I have subsequently put together what I call a go-to book, and the go-to book tells me basically if I got 15 minutes, what, is, what do I want to want to grab? When I was <clears throat> grabbing things to take out of the house, uh, I grabbed all the old clothes so my wife would have clothes to wear. Of course, leaving all the good stuff in the house, and everybody's giving the old clothes, so that was the most stupid thing. But I did grab some pictures, and I grabbed a couple things. But the point being is that you don't. You're not rational when, when that disaster is coming. Just remember that you may think you're rational now and you may have an idea, but talk it over with your partner, your spouse, whoever, and decide <clears throat> what do I do if I have 15 minutes, what do I do if I have an hour? Because we are going to have another disaster again and you want to be prepared for that. Um, there is a book that was written, my wife referred to it, uh, of, that would be very helpful if anybody ever, you know, experiences the loss of a home and a fire. Uh, that helps you go through and cherry pick everything that you had in your house before. But uh, I was very interested in the contents area and went down to help the people in Ramona. And they had a fire exactly 10 years to the day after our fire. And it was quite an experience to go down there and see what they went through. And uh, uh, again, it's the people that uh, I found very, very interesting working with. And uh, I just encourage you guys to heed what I've said. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, this will be the last speaker. <laughs> My name's Charlie Quilter. Uh, some of you know I'm a retired Marine. And on the 27th, I was out at El Toro, and a little bit before noon, I noticed a plume of smoke. And I'm a retired aviator, and uh, the winds were blowing about 35 knots from the north, and I didn't like the location of this little plume. So I decided I would get on home right away. I just dropped everything got in the car, I realized I wasn't going to be able to get down Laguna Canyon Road, where I live, uh, just north of Big Ben. And uh, so I came out the back gate and went down El Toro Road. There was a single CHP guy. It was very early, and uh, he was not, let, not letting anybody through, but he would let me walk through. So I started off at a trot, and then I got picked up by a great guy on a motorcycle. I don't know what he was doing, but he... Uh, <laughs> He uh, gave me a ride down to my house, and the fire was just, at that point, uh, right at the intersection of Laguna Canyon Road and El Toro Road. And it was moving very, very fast. And I, I was really, uh, I was quite astonished. Now, one of the things that they teach you if you're a pilot or if you're, a, if you're in military service is that you never have perfect situation awareness. I had no idea that the main spear of the fire 
that was actually shooting down Emerald Bay Canyon and starting to burn up houses in, uh, in Emerald Bay. So I got to the house. First, first thing I did, I said, okay, I was going to, uh, you, we live in a little pocket canyon. Fire burns uphill, and I said, okay, I have a chance to either stay and fight, providing I've got a, um, a way out. Uh, always you want to leave yourself a way out. I'd been in enough brush fires in, around Laguna growing up. And so I, uh, and then this gentle, the gentleman here said, what do you save? So I grabbed an empty garbage, or I took a garbage can, I dumped it upside down, and ran into the house. I collected all the family videos and all the family photo albums, and a couple other things, uh, and, and a, a CPU unit in those days. Computers are very big, but I was writing a book for the Marine Corps at the time, so I, I picked that thing up, dropped it in there, drug it out, stuck it in the middle of the, uh, of the driveway, figuring, you know, if the asphalt's burning, then we're all in very serious trouble. Put the lid on it and said, okay, now, and then I, I got all the hoses out and, and stood by. Meanwhile, the fire came roaring by, um, and it was, uh, it was spectacular. There's a very picturesque grove of oak trees across from our house, and I was fascinated by what happened when the fire, which was extremely hot, very palpable, you could feel it, uh, uh, from across the canyon. And as soon as it hit these oak trees, coast live oaks, it, the, it was like the oaks had just swallowed up the flames and the fire burned all around them. And the trees just sat there and, and uh, the, the, the duff was burning, smoldering, but the, the trees didn't look like they were harmed at all and they weren't. And I get, realize it's a way that the oak trees have a way of uh, preserving themselves. Well, as I was schlepping out this garbage can, the phone rang. And, and uh, I remember, this is before cell phones. You couldn't, couldn't get a hold of anybody. I was worried about my wife and our kids who were in, one was at Thurston, one was at, uh, well, they were both, one was at Thurston, one was at Top of the World. And, uh, but my, the VW van was gone, so I said, okay, she's, something's happened, I don't know what. So I, uh, I got to answer the phone call, and there's this helicopter right over our house, and it's CBS. They want to know, is this Charles Quilter? And I said, well, yeah, what's me? <laughs> and it's one of these surreal things that happens. He says, well, what are you doing? I said, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> I'm trying to get my uh, uh, photo, photo albums and videos out of the house. <laughs> and he, said, and uh, he apologized, and uh, so I, I got out. Uh, then there was an interesting turning point. We had this colossal, uh, uh, we, I noticed that we didn't get any aircraft on the scene. That was one thing that interested me as a pilot until very late in the day and the sun was starting to set and I said, these guys are not going to come at night. I, uh, I was a fighter attack pilot and I said, not going to be hurling themselves uh, in mountainous terrain. Uh, Towards, uh, towards the earth, and I, I was right about that, but I, not, but I got a bad feeling about where the, the, I didn't have any wheels, I had no, no way to get around other than on foot, and uh, I started to see Skyline drive, I said, oh, I didn't like the direction of that fire. Well, that night, the winds died down, and then we got the, uh, breezes coming off the ocean, and so the fire started to march back on the other side of the canyon. And there was a hotshot crew at the foot of the driveway, of my driveway, and he said, do you live here? And I said, yes, I do. And I said, do you know any way up to the top of that ridge? And this is how the fire got stopped. So I think ending, ending if I'm the last person, it might tell you how the, how the, fire, how the fire actually got stopped in Laguna Canyon. Um, I led them up Castle Rock Road, and then I showed them a, a trail that was a very faint trail down a ridge line. I said, look, this is really rough. And he said, he said well, these guys, you know, they had all their picks and shovels. And they started, they, this is, and it's dark. They're start, the fire is marching, slowly burning towards them on the, on the breeze off the Pacific. And uh, there was a a small tanker truck up on the ridge line. 
Now this is before they built the new reservoirs and everything. This was just a truck with a tanker. These guys got themselves up to the top of the ridge, started a backfire, and that was burning towards the oncoming fire. And this is one of the techniques that I, you know, I really appreciated how backfires work at this point. So these guys are slowly working their way down this ridge line that they just crawled their way up. They had their ho they had this a very small hose. It looked like you know barely bigger than a, but they had a lot of it. And they uh, they started uh, uh, setting a backfire and and with and they positioned a guy every so many feet until it got down and the fire just uh, the backfire burned into the oncoming fire. Fire went out and so on down until it, it got down to the foot of the uh, canyon just beyond our house. And I thought that was a really interesting piece of firefighting and that's how the fire ended in Laguna Canyon. That was about, uh, I guess, nine or 10 that night. But it was, uh, of course, it's one of those days that none of us will ever forget. Well, it started at the very top of the canyon up by up north of Laguna Lakes, as far as I could tell. And uh, this is when we still had the old road. Um, and I just noticed a little plume. I, for some reason, it caught my attention. I was, I was out uh, right at the intersection of the runways at El Toro. And, um, and I said, I'd, the wind was so strong. I mean, there was debris and everything blowing along uh, uh, that I thought, uh, you know, I better get on home because this, this could turn out to be real bad, and, and it did. But that was a... Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. The, uh, the program is scheduled from 7.30 to 9.30, and it is now 9.30, so we need to bring this to a close. I want to thank everybody for participating, and uh, I thought the video clip uh, of uh, Nancy Lindsay going out the day after the fire uh, brings images to us that, uh, uh, so let's thank Nancy Lindsay. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, in the uh, back table, there are newsletters. If you didn't receive one in the mail, please help yourself, brochures to the Murphy Smith bungalow. And we have uh, uh, envelopes with our address. So if you'd like to send us something like suggestions for our programs, uh, contributions. We are trying to we, uh, raise money for the maintenance fund. I guess we need to replace the roof of the Murphy Smith bungalow. Uh, we uh, are recording this program. We, we've recorded the programs over the last several years. They're at the Murphy Smith bungalow, and you're welcome to borrow it, go watch it, bring it back. If you'd like to have it as a copy, uh, you're welcome to do that. We, we do request the, the cost of reproduction, a $6 donation. But uh, please uh, come and see this program if you'd like, and uh, past ones. Uh, and um, uh, Skip Hallowell is here. Uh, he, his, his book is Loving Laguna, A Local's Guide to Laguna Beach. And that will be the next program, uh, Tuesday, November 26th, from 7.30, 9.30 p.m. And in addition, he'll give a, he'll give a survey of the homestead, homesteading families of Laguna Beach. Uh, Kimberly, you want to close the program? Well, goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll have a chance after we... Um, Jean, Jean, please, come on up. It's okay, Jean. It'll work out just fine. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Eugene Diazabella. Everybody knows me as Diz. I spent 46 years with our fire department, eight as a volunteer and 38 and a half full time. At the time of fire, I was a captain. I was not on duty that day, but they called me back in to man uh, the state fire truck we had and bring a crew. In our first response, I called the, the chief, uh, Joe McClure, and uh, Asked them where they want us to go. We want us out the canyon. Says no, they need help at Emerald Bay. Go to Emerald Bay and help them there. So we headed out to Emerald Bay. And when we, when we got there, we found the county had just set up a, a command post right in front. And they told us, well, they didn't need us up inside. They want us to protect the houses along the road on both sides. 
because there were embers flying and stuff. So we were there for oh, a couple hours, and then he told us they wanted us to go on down to the trailer park because the fire was moving in there to help the guys at the trailer park. So we went down there, spent a little time helping a, little, a couple of the fires there, and then he came down and brought 10 fire trucks from Northern California, and he gave them to me and said, don't let it burn Corona Del Mar. So we went out to Newport Coast Road, and he also sent a pickup with two uh, county pickup with two firefighters that had backfiring equipment. And so we went up Newport Coast Road, and we actually built more fires than we put out. We went along there, and fortunately at that time, they were just starting to build that area up, so there was a lot of vacant stuff on the side of the road. And so we spent the day building backfires and stuff, and end up that evening in, at, after dark in Turtle Rock. And so we sat there overnight and waited. In the morning they came and relieved those 10 fire trucks, told us that they wanted us to stay, and they put us with a strike team that was made up from fire trucks from the Marine bases. So we spent that day all day putting out little spot fires in the fields around the, the area. There were actually cows and stuff of some of these fields that would go out in there and start digging around and <laughs> covering up stuff for them, waiting for one of the bulls to attack us or something. But they didn't. And so finally we got relieved. And by the time we got back to Laguna, it was midnight of the following day. And as we drove in, of course, there was all this stuff set up on Main Beach. And then finally got to go home. The fire had burned a couple blocks above my house. I live up on Holly Street. And my wife had never left. And I says, well, why didn't you leave? She says, well, they just came down to Monterey, which is two houses above, or two houses above ours. And they came and told the people above the, to evacuate. They didn't tell us. So she never left. But fortunately, the fire didn't come down into the area. And uh, it was one of the big, biggest fires that I was at in my career. And I got to see a lot of them over all those years. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So with that, again, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you for your participation and, and this great information. Again, it's on DVD, and I know I'm going to be watching it real soon. So again, thank you so much. And maybe some of the, the uh, firefighters in the back might be able to stay and, and answer a few more questions. Uh, so again, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Nancy, very much.